there's so much going on in AI these days that it's, it's difficult to pick out any one thing or, or small set of things as, as the most exciting. R really, what's most amazing is just the, the breadth of work going on, the number of people applying AI in, in so many different areas and the number of different AI ideas that are, are being explored further and further and, and, and coming to fruition. So we, we've got exciting stuff happening in applying well-known techniques to new practical problems and, and to old familiar practical problems with better and better results. And then we have researchers exploring the, the cutting edge and developing new algorithms and new, new ideas, new, new ways of, of thinking. So on the, on the application side, I think the things that have impressed me are about the same things that, that have, have impressed everybody else. I mean, of course, AlphaGo was very cool and that's a problem I thought about a lot because my, my oldest son, Zarathustra, is a Go player and we'd followed computer Go fairly well and when, a few years ago we were seeing all these papers on using deep learning to guide Monte Carlo search and Zar and I actually had a conversation where we said, hey, you know, these ideas are quite interesting and you might be able to use these to beat Go, right? And then I went back to doing my usual work and he went back to teaching Japanese as he was doing, doing at the time and studying AI and neuroscience. I mean, we could see these techniques in deep learning and Monte Carlo search were appropriate for Go, but to make it work is another thing. And D DeepMind made it work, which, is, which is, is quite cool. And I think a lot of people in the computer Go community had the idea that technique could succeed, but didn't have the, the resources to put all the pieces together and do all the training and, and testing it. And then DeepMind did it. This exemplifies two quite interesting things. One is DeepMind's AlphaGo software is really a hybrid architecture. So you have a deep neural network and then you have Monte Carlo game tree search looking at a simulation engine and you're putting these components together to, to play Go. So it's not just, hey, throw Go at a deep neural network. It's a hybrid architecture with a couple different pieces. The other thing you see there is the core ideas came from some academic papers, but it was a tech company that really made the thing work. And these two trends are things that we're seeing all over the place. We're seeing hybrid architectures uh, starting to bear a lot of fruit, and we're also seeing more and more cases where ideas that sprang out of academic research are they're made to work by, by big tech companies and that same pattern is there in other very well-known successes of AI recently. I mean, successes at face recognition and, and speech recognition and so forth. These are more standard deep learning type architectures and indeed Deep neural nets have been around forever. I, I was teaching about deep neural networks and recurrent back propagation in the mid 1990s when I was a professor in the University of Western Australia. Other people were doing these well before that, but again, it was big tech companies that pulled together the data, the compute power, the, the IT code optimization chops to make these well known algorithms that come out of academia really scale up and, and, and solve, solve amazing problems. And that the success that's been gotten with the deep neural networks has been exciting for me and, and everyone else to see. And the limitations, I think, are obvious to me and to those of us who've thought a lot about cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience and AGI, 
And they're also obvious to a lot of deep learning researchers, but they're not necessarily that obvious to people who read, read, read reports about what deep neural networks are doing now in, in, the, in the mass media. And with, one thing I've often said is that the current crop of deep neural nets is a crude but interesting model of the feed-forward activity in the visual and auditory cortex. So it's a decent model with a lot of changes to adapt the algorithms to current computing hardware. A decent model of what happens when you're seeing or hearing in the first half second or so before the cognitive parts of the brain do their, their more advanced and conceptual feedback to the, to the perception process. What we're not modeling there is hippocampus with its various kinds of, of working memory and localized memory, basal ganglia with its influence on, on goals and, and goal-driven activity, cerebellum with its reasoning about, about sequences, the thalamus and its interactions with the cortex, amygdala, the limbic system with its emotions, and then the dozens of other important brain areas, each of which has its own architecture and its own dynamics, and all of which act in a coordinated way to produce human intelligence. And so I was thinking for a while, the next step for those who like deep neural networks a lot should be to take deep net architectures and connect them with other components which architecturally reflect other parts of the brain besides visual and auditory cortex in their connectivity structure and dynamics. And then you would gradually build architectures with more and more different neural net components that reflect different parts of the brain and what they do. And I said this to a bunch of people. It's not a direction I was pursuing because my own preferred approach to AGI is just less closely tied to how the, how the brain works.